Okay, we're back, we're live. Wow, this is a day for energy. Uh, Mina Morita joins us uh, by Skype, phones, audio, and uh, Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar, he joins us from Hilo. And this is Mina, Marco, and me, and it's what's happening now in energy. Um, and uh, we, we're, we're at a kind of a crux point, aren't we? Um, you know, things, things are still settling down from the decision of the PUC. So uh, what, what do you guys think about that? I mean, what do you think about the Nextera? Um, first, Nextera paid $90 million, and then it, it pulled up stakes, uh, like saying, when, you're not going to see us here anymore. We're going to Chile, just like the TMT. Uh, <laughs> what do you think? Mm -hmm. Oh, for me, I, well, you know, I, I, I think given the way they were treated, why should they remain in Hawaii? Um, you know, now it's up to Hawaiian Electric to perform on their own. Um, you know, at this time, they've made it clear that they weren't looking at any suitors. So uh, basically, it's time to move on. Well, uh, Marco, what about you? Well, good afternoon, first of all, to the both of you. Pleasure to be with you uh, two Mondays consecutively. That That's is great. a real treat and a great way to start uh, start my week. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the past 10 or so days in the energy world uh, here in Hawaii have been uh, rather <laughs> monumental <laughs> on uh, a number of levels, and uh, I think we're still kind of uh, taking stock. Uh, not surprising... I guess that uh, next year I decided that not only were they terminating the merger agreement as they did a week ago, but that uh, they're out 100%, it would appear, from pursuing any uh, renewable energy projects under sea cable and, and so forth. So not only are they gone, but they're emphatically gone. So now uh, we're, we're in the day after, and uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how things play out in the days and weeks to, to come. There was an interesting piece by uh, ECO President Alan Oshima yeah, in uh, the Star Advertiser yesterday uh, that uh, used some rather interesting, juicy language in terms of, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get it right, and uh, we, we're still fully functional here, and we know what we need to do, and uh, let's, let's try to move forward collectively, collaboratively, rather than go back into some type of toxic uh, adversarial relationship. So I appreciate Alan's words, and uh, I would hope that we, we can be more collaborative uh, than we have been in the past because we got so much, so much that we need to do to work together to try to uh, go in the direction I think we all agree we need to go in. Yeah, I mean, I mean his uh, concern seems really legitimate to me that, uh, you know, we've, we've had this 18-month experience. Now we go back and, um, and um, you know, enjoy the same toxic environment as we had before. I mean, it's a real possibility of that, isn't there? Yeah, no. and, uh, well, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, the thing is, you need a willing seller. <laughs> you don't have a willing seller. Uh, I don't see them re-entering the, that toxic environment in the near future. <laughs> well, sure. Uh, I, you know, I guess that it opens up a couple of questions. But, but really, I mean, before the deal, the environment was pretty toxic. Everybody was, um, you know, complaining about HECO. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really a happy time. I thought uh, that when that deal was announced, it was a good thing simply for the fact that it would, it would give us a new deal. Uh, it, would, it would sort of, you know, make some distance from the toxic environment that existed before. Instead, the toxic environment seemed to infect the deal. I mean, the public reaction to the deal and the government reaction to the deal. Uh, and now the question is, uh, you know, uh, wh what's changed so that Alan Oshima's wish will be granted? Well, I think, I mean, it's, it's too early to, to tell what has changed, but uh, I think there, uh, I mean, we, we simply just have to move away from, from what I feel to be such a uh, almost demonizing relationship towards the utility company. Uh, that I think uh, affects so many uh, stakeholders uh, in, in the energy realm, uh, whether it's uh, in the legislature or the public writ large, because I just don't see how, how having such an adversarial relationship benefits us. And I, I, I think there's a lot more common ground than there is ground that, that cause for, for differences. So I may be uh, Pollyanna in that regard, but uh, 
I, I think, uh, I mean, we just, uh, you know, in the words of that great philosopher, Rodney King, can't we all just get along a little bit better? Well, that's what we were saying before. But, you know, one of the, one of the many things that happened, you know, in this uh, extraordinary transition of finding out, you know, where we're going now, was that uh, there was a piece in the paper uh, where Chris Lee was, uh, Representative Chris Lee was um, entertaining a group of people. I guess that might have included you, or at least they were talking about you, Marco, um, to talk about other business models for utilities. Um, and that, that was, um, you know, that was his reaction to the termination of the deal. So, uh, query, where does that take us? It's certainly, it's not a, it's not a direction that is necessarily, um, you know, uh, uh, amenable to uh, Alan Noshima's wish. Oh, Mina, you want to chime in on that? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, the thing is, um, and I and I wrote about this in a blog that, you know, the government shouldn't be in the business of matchmaking private interests. Um, especially when one is an unwilling seller. Um, if government has a problem with the way the uh, electricity service is provided, the legislature has the role of reviewing the franchise, revoking the franchise, and putting up for auction. You think they would ever do that? That'd be pretty drastic. Well... Well, that's, that's their authority. It's not their business to go actually the, 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 the you know, it's, a, it's a private business. So if, if they want to use their authority properly, then it is the review of the franchise and, and um, the possible act, auction of the franchise. It's not matchmaking, you know, and I think this will sort of um, the, the put this in a more serious light than this constant um, uh, improper intervening in a, in a private enter entity. Yeah. Yes, they have the right to regulate, but they don't have the right to you know, run the operations of, of Hawaiian Electric or, 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 or find new owners for Hawaiian Electric. So, so we have that issue, and it's, uh, you know, you still hear stories about maybe there will be somebody, even if there isn't anybody now, who would be interested. But, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about all these changes, and uh, these changes are so far removed from the initiative itself, from moving down the track, you know, getting to 2045, which is really, I keep saying it's right around the corner because you can't wait till 2044 to, to do clean energy. You've got to do it now. Um, and you're going to have a, you know, a ramp up plan to do it. Uh, so all these things to me seem to be distractions. Um, the, the whole thing uh, with, you know, what happened with uh, the next era, you know, process, huge distraction. Uh, this thing, sorry, Marco, but this thing with uh, changing the utility model, it's, it's also takes us off the track. Uh, are we going to get there any faster dealing with these things? Seems like, um, you know, w w where we started out saying we're going to have clean energy, now every time you look, there's something else that distracts us from that path. Am I right? I think there are a lot of distractions. Jay, I agree completely with you. I also agree with Mina uh, from her her position as well in terms of the of uh, the legislature and I mean if uh, I haven't done a poll of the 51 House members and the 25 Senate members 76 total legislators so I can't claim to have any data in front of me but I would be very very surprised if there was anything close to a majority in either body let alone both bodies that would essentially want to go down the path of what well, would be a very hostile takeover essentially in terms of somehow condemning the eco franchise, taking it taking it away, and using the power of eminent domain, I just I just don't see that happening. And it's it's this weird interplay of politics, regulatory uh, bodies, and and a private company. And 
that I mean, there are ways to get private companies that are publicly traded uh, to to do what you want them to do. Typically, shareholders, right? Shareholders have a lot of power depending on how they feel the company's being run, dividends, and so forth and so on. And you know, one kind of interesting thing that you guys have probably noticed as well is any talk of uh, HEI stock price tanking after uh, next year decided to go back to Florida is certainly hasn't happened yet at least i mean they're they were trading as of this morning 31 dollars a share which is just a just a skosh under what they were trading before uh before the deal was uh, was pronounced dead mm-hmm. so it's uh to go back to your question yeah i think there are a lot of distractions going on and and i think uh i, I think alan nails it alan oshima nails it that uh we do have a shared mission here collectively, and there's just a lot more that we can do together uh, by by talking to each other, with each other, than at each other. And I mean, again, showing my my narrow kind of parochial interest uh, running a solar company is that there are uh, a number of really super critical dockets open before the commission now: uh, the DER docket, decoupling, demand response. And I can only hope that now that there's been a, a substantial infusion of oxygen into the room with the, the commissioners, that they'll be able to move with more alacrity on these important dockets than now that the, 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 the folks that next year have been uh, unceremoniously or ceremoniously told to go home. Because, I mean, we got so much, so, so much is, for my business and the PV industry and the solar industry is riding on decisions that we need much sooner rather than later from this commission. So Let me take a short break, Marco. Um, and, yes. um, gee, I, you know, I sure agree with you. I mean, we, we've been talking about trying to collaborate for a long time, and uh, surely it is the time to do that. Uh, we should be talking about getting to our goals without further distractions. It is the time to do that. Query whether that is happening or will happen. Let's take a short break and come back and, and, and talk to Mina Marita about the status of her lawsuit on the PUC, because that, that's pretty profound uh, also and will affect things going forward. We'll be right back. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. Okay, we're back. We're live with me and Marita and uh, Marco Mangelsdorf talking about what's, what's happening now in energy. So, Mina, as we left it, you were going to give us an update on your lawsuit and how that whole issue around the, uh, the PUC and the dynamics of the PUC in the final days of Mike Champley's, uh, you know, participation there as a commissioner and thereafter and the vote and the abstention and what, what might have been a switched vote by one of the commissioners. Um, how does that affect the PUC internally, externally and going forward? Well, I, I you know, the, the major question at the PUC right now is whether or not you have a new commissioner that's properly seated. You know, I contend that um, Tom Gorak is not properly seated and that his appointment is unlawful. Um, so to that effect, you know, we have a lawsuit moving forward to address the question. Um, m- my understanding is that um, w- my attorney has a um, stipulated order that is in the process of being signed by the judge laying out the procedures. Uh, one is a Kowanto petition which is um, issued by the court to the defendant, Tom Gorak, um, where he needs to state 
um, what lawful right he has to sit in that position. Um, and and then, uh, you know, the, the state will have a chance to file its statement of position um, in August. I don't have the exact dates in front of me. Uh, where we will reply five days later, and then there's a hearing set for August 25th. Okay. Well, um, while this is pending, it certainly leaves things up in the air, because if you prevail, not, not to say what your chances are, but if you prevail, then uh, that arguably undermines the decisions they make in the interim. Well, I, I think right now, you know, if, if we prevail, it's sure as hell tanking ongoing proceedings right now that Borak participates in. That would include um, that would include the next era uh, decision, and uh, I guess what's really interesting. Uh, well, I suppose um, it could include it because he abstained, and maybe it wouldn't include. It makes it a little another wrinkle, another nuance. He abstains, so query if you prevail, does that? undermine the next era and and if, even if it does undermine the next era you can't uh, put Humpty back together again next era would not you know return to the the table they're out of town they're yeah. gone so that's a, that's an interesting hypothetical uh, well, let, me, you know, yeah. let me let me ask but, you a but, quick question sorry go ahead Marco ask your question I was just gonna ask you Mina whether do you see any plausible plausible realistic scenario where Mike Champley would uh, conceivably be re reinstated or do you think that that's not even a uh, possibility oh I mean if we prevail if we prevail he never lost the seat in the first place in he is um, my understanding um, he is the uh, de jury officer so he is legally entitled to that position and he never lost it yeah but that's only until <laughs> someone else is appointed and qualified so uh, right. you know, even I, if you I, prevail uh, I doubt that the governor Ige is going to appoint him again he didn't want to appoint him before uh, he'll and he'll he'll I guess he could reappoint Tom Gorak yeah uh, and, and then yeah, of you know, course seek he, confirmation he, he would he he would sit he would sit um, in that position until some his successor is appointed and qualified. Mm -hmm. so, well, which would um, not take place unless Mike were to resign, which would not take place until January next year at the, the soonest, because that's when the legislature goes back into session. Well, that's, right? a, that's an interesting yeah. question, because if, if, if Mike, um, you know, if, that, if, if Mina prevails then, and no uh, successor is appointed and qualified, then... Uh, I think the law is clear that uh, th that Mike would continue as a commissioner. Question then, just like the next era question, is whether he'd be willing to come back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, you know, and and this lawsuit is a, is important for other reasons that that um, you know it will clarify the process on you know when that language when the holdover language is used and when a vacancy is created. You know, yeah, um, yeah. I I have I have I have no qualms with the governor appointing when there is a vacancy. You know, but in this case, um, given the successor language, I don't believe a vacancy has been created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's move and on the, to another topic in our remaining time. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, and that would be the topic of LNG. Um, we, um, we, we, we've heard about LNG for years. We've had discussions and programs and, oh, gee, everybody has weighed in on LNG um, as part of the package. But now it seems like uh, next era is gone. They would have uh, provided some funding to develop LNG. Um, and, uh, and Hawaiian Electric has said it, you know, it terminated its LNG development contract, big contract. Um, and I don't, we haven't heard from Hawaii Gas about it that I know of, but it, it's, it sounds really quiet now about LNG. I mean, is, is LNG still around? What's the deal? Well, I, I think, you know, again, you know the administration's position on LNG. Um, we've, we've had good programs on your show on, you know, what the benefits of could be for LNG in mitigating oil price volatility um, and give us 
uh, a little bit more stable pricing as we move forward. And, and, and so I think it's incumbent on this administration, the EG administration, to show where can we get cost savings to offset the investment that needs to be made um, as we develop um, our, our clean energy infrastructure. Um, you know, and that's what we have not heard is, you know, as, as we move forward, we know it's going to cost money. And what's the potential offset mm. to those um, consumer costs? Yeah, it's it really, you know, in the end, I think money is a big part of this whole discussion. Um, so uh, we talked last time about how um, Wine Electric was going to use uh, the, uh, the, the, net, the net received after taxes of that $90 million, that, and that would be, what, I think $60 million to develop the grid. I was going to put in another, according to the paper, going to put in 100, 100 and a quarter more uh, to develop the grid, but that may, may or may not be enough to actually develop the grid. Next Air is not around to uh, throw its resources into that development. Um, the LNG, you know, benefits, uh, savings, if you will, uh, won't, won't be around if uh, Hawaiian Electric is not going to develop LNG. So where does the money come from? And let me add one for you, Marco. Um, if you prevail, uh, Hawaii, Hawaii Island, uh, you know, co-op, energy co-op, uh, would you do LNG? Would you seek LNG? Would you advocate for LNG? Any ideas about that? Well, let me let me opine a little bit about LNG. I think, uh, I mean, practically speaking, uh, if the largest company in the state, Hawaiian Electric Industries and Eco Miko Helco, if they decide not to move forward with their stated plans to develop LNG as a power source for their power plants, and to what extent their cancellation of the contract with Fortis Energy in Canada uh, indicates that they are pretty definitively pulling the plug on the LNG option. I really don't know. I'm not privy to that discussion. But I think it's a big step at any rate. It's a big step that they're not moving forward with Fortis. So, you know, there can be a lot of talk and, and policy levels and, and environmental groups and solar groups about LNG good, LNG bad. But the main players in the state regarding LNG are essentially the utility companies and Hawaii Gas. So, you know, kind of regardless of what the governor wants to do or what Chris Lee wants to do, I mean, not that's kind of uh, exaggerating somewhat. I mean, ultimately, these are business decisions which two of the major players, the utility companies and the gas company, are going to be making. Does this make sense or not? What's the risk-reward? What's the likelihood of a near-term payoff versus losing their shirts? So I think, you know, if you're, you're looking at the trend lines, uh, the odds against LNG are certainly greater now than they were two weeks ago, two months ago, six months ago. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, LNG uh, could have been a, a bridge possibility. May, maybe there's still a possibility, but Governor Rige has a way of, um, you know, following through on his uh, opinions and inclinations as, as he did on NextEra. That certainly uh, was, a, you know, an a interesting connection between his remarks a year ago and what happened a few weeks ago on next era and maybe maybe the same you know effect will happen on is happening on lng uh but you know in the end in the end uh and i'd like your opinion on this to close in the end if you want to put in new infrastructure if you want to move ahead to 2045 if you want to build out the grid and take take advantage of all that technology out there make it happen in accordance with our goals and targets and what have you you have to install new equipment new equipment costs money somebody has to pay for that uh, and that means if nobody else pays for it well even if somebody else pays in in the short term for it the consumers are going to have to pay for the new equipment Is, am i right kind of makes us a bit wistful for the days of daniel Lenoe being uh being such the uh the breadwinner and the pork the pork bringer as far as federal money from uh, from Washington over his long and distinguished tenure in the U.S. Senate and uh, the junior people we have there now, you know, they're great folks, Maisie, Maisie Hirono and Brian Schatz, but, you know, things are different than when uh, when Dan Inoue was there. So, yeah, people are going to have to pay for it. So I'm, I'm more interested myself in kind of near-term savings uh, that are going to pay immediate, more immediate benefits uh, to, to rate payers and give relief to people who are struggling to pay 
pay their electric bills than uh, how things look 5, 10, let alone 29 years from now in 2045. Yeah. Well, you know, we could have, A, the cost of, you know, introducing all that new equipment, B, um, you know, not, not have the funding we hoped for, and C, we could have oil go up again. And all those three things would mean higher rates uh, for the consumers. And uh, that, that would take us to another place. And that, that possibility is out there. What are your thoughts about this, Mina? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think we need to dig down and deal in pragmatic reality. Um, you know, and, and the EGA administration has to come up with a plan B. They can't move forward and quash all of these um, ongoing efforts without a replacement and this is what I'd like to see in the near future uh, and near future me now <laughs> um, <laughs> you know um, what 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 is the plan B you know what is the plan B to move forward um, give some kind of customer relief as as we head off to um, uh, our, our clean energy endeavors. Um, you know, how how do we deal with this pragmatically moving forward? How do we make sure that, you know, these benefits are um, realized by all customers, not just the ones that can afford or take advantage of tax credits to adopt um, the newer technology. Yeah. So, you know, what, what, what is the systems approach that we have here as we move forward? Big question. And, uh, you know, uh, even though we knew that it was a logical possibility, if not a, a substantial logical possibility, that Nextera, you know, would, would be denied uh, this deal, um, somehow we find ourselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment of surprise. Uh, you know, may perhaps uh, to some extent unprepared uh, to move forward, un unprepared with the, with the plan B. And uh, as you said, Marco, and I think as Ellen Oshima has said on many occasions, it's, it's, time, it's time to get together and, um, you know, find common ground and move forward in a collaborative way. This is, this is hard. We haven't been successful at this in the past, but now's the time. Um, anyway, I want to mention that uh, on August 16th, there's Hawaii Clean Energy Day by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Mina, you're one of the speakers there, I think. Um, and I hope people sign up. You can sign up and get more information about it at uh, hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu. Uh, any closing words, you guys? Uh, I have a feeling we're no longer in Kansas anymore, Toto. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's have another discussion soon. Thank you so much, Mina. Thank you so much, Marco. Aloha, okay. you guys. <laughs>